Welcome to It Is Written Canada. Thank you for joining us here in beautiful Kelowna, British Columbia. Our special guest is Dawn Straub, who is a practicing clinical counselor and also a writer. And we will tell you more about his book at the end of our program today. Don will share with us his intriguing personal story, which we believe will strengthen your faith in the biblical God of love and freedom, who is as active in our lives today as he was in Bible times. Don, welcome to It Is Written Canada. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. I've been watching It Is Written since I was in elementary school. I'm not, it's hard to believe I am here. Don, tell us a little bit about yourself. I've spent uh, the first 38 years of my career as a teacher, a little bit of elementary, mostly high school. I've been a principal of a K-12 school, a pastor of a church. And but for the last 10 years after that 38, I have been a clinical counselor here in Kelowna. How did you come to know Jesus and salvation? I was born into a Christian family and from a very early age, I had a, a close relationship with God. I always loved Jesus, I always loved God. But when I turned about 18 in university, I had a very different experience when it comes to this. I seemed to be going through a real struggle. I, I, deep down, I didn't feel like it was ever gonna be good enough to be able to make it into heaven. In fact, my roommate would complain because I would toss and turn in our bunk bed and I'd keep him awake. And one day I saw this advertisement and I decided to sign up for a Bible conference, which was at the base of Mount Hood near Portland, Oregon. And I was sleeping in the dormitories above the main area. And I woke up tossing and turning and I couldn't sleep. And I had this impression that I should just get up and go downstairs. And so I got out of the bunk bed and I, I went downstairs and I noticed over there in the corner, there was a group of people in a circle and uh, they called me over and they said, why did you come down? And I said, I have no idea. I just felt impressed that I should come down and I don't know why I'm here. And they said, well, we just finished praying, asking God to wake somebody up that doesn't know you as a personal friend. And you came down. I burst into tears. And then I told them what my struggle was about feeling like I could never be good enough to make it to heaven. Well, within just minutes, they shared with me the gospel. They told me that when I accept Jesus as my personal savior, I am treated by God as if I've never sinned, I'm justified. And that from there on, God wants to have a personal relationship with me. And after that night, my life has never been the same since. So Donna, how did this experience change your life? Well, just about that same time in history, there was this huge revival going across America with teenagers and young people in universities and high schools. And so I became what they called in those days a Jesus freak. Well, in the evenings, almost every night, uh, the college students at our campus would meet in the student center and we would sing and pray and we would share testimonies and study the Bible, sitting on the floor cross-legged. And on weekends, I would take my Bible and I would go downtown into this city, stand on the street corner and talk to anybody about Jesus who would listen. So then you finished college, Don. Uh, what direction did your life take after that? Well, to sort of understand that, I wanna say that for two summers, my last two summers in college, I would volunteer with a group of other students and we would go to a major Canadian city. And what we would do there is we'd spend the summer reaching out to youth. But this was something where we didn't get paid for anything. In fact, we had to 
lean on God to provide our food, our transportation, our housing. We would ask people in the church. And yeah, there's some, it was some amazing times we had in those summers doing ministry to the youth. But it was in the second summer that I met someone who was on our, our team and her name was Nellie. And I, as I worked with Nellie on this mission team, I began to realize that she really loved Jesus and she had a really quality character. Long story short, uh, we got married after college. She had a heart for missions as well. She had this childhood dream of being a missionary in Africa. So we, we put in an application, go as missionaries to Africa, and we forgot all about it because six years later in another city working as a teacher in high school, and four children later, in fact, our last child was born the day before I got this call to be a missionary in Tanzania, Africa. In fact, that day I was picking Nellie up from the hospital with our newborn, and I took her out to a restaurant to eat, and I shared her this news that we have been called as missionaries to go to Tanzania, Africa. Without skipping a beat, Nellie said, let's go. Nellie used to always say, the safest place on earth is wherever God is. And the two of us believed that if by any act or word we could make a dark life brighter, we would do it. Don, you and Nelly accepted the invitation to go to Africa as missionaries. What was life like in Africa? Yes, eight months later and we found ourselves there with four children, most of them in diapers. It took an, another year before all of our belongings came and arrived there. So for the first year, we were living in a house with only the suitcases that we had brought. We ate on the floor, we played on the floor, everything was on the floor, no furniture. Uh, my wife and I, and Ellie and I, we would be on our knees at the bathtub with ice cold water, no hot water, ice cold water, doing the laundry by hand and then hanging the clothes on the bushes outside the house. We had to iron those clothes to kill the uh, mango fly worms or eggs. Uh, we only had one opportunity each week to go 
couple kilometers walking with the four children. One of us carried one of us on the back, one of them on our backs, like a backpack, and the other two were walking with us carrying baskets. We had to buy a tire week's worth of food on that market day. Uh, there's no processed food, there's no canned or box foods. We had to clean the, the, the dirt and the sand and the gravel out of the beans and the rice. We had to, Nellie had to cook our food on charcoal on the ground outside the back of our house. That was our lifestyle. In my role there at, at uh, Pirani, where I was working, I was working 12 hour days. I was teaching, I was supervising students in the fields in the evening, I was supervising study periods. And unfortunately, I had left my personal one-to-one -one relationship with God slide. Don, I know from experience that it's very dangerous to let your personal devotional life slide. And you were a missionary, so people might be wondering, how did that happen? Well, you know, I started to use the excuse that we had only one kerosene lamp for the entire house and everybody seemed to want it. My wife needed it to help the children and this and that, and I was tired. And so I just went to bed when, the, when it got dark and got up when it got light. My wife and I would, we'd read the Bible together uh, while we worked together. She'd be working in the garden and I would read the Bible uh, together with her during my lunch breaks. but. You know, I just didn't have that one hour in the morning time with God like I was used to over the years. What happened was one day, my best friend, who was an African teacher there, I was the only uh, foreign staff member, he came to me and he said, Don, it's my birthday. And I'm really feeling kind of low and I'm feeling down. I just don't feel my life has purpose anymore. I just feel like I'm not a very good Christian. And I went, my mind, I thought, Hanga, you're one of the best Christians I know here. But I said to him, Tanga, I think I know, I think I know what you're experiencing because I'm feeling the same way. I'm just feeling like a little bit out of touch with God. Maybe the difference between us is I know the solution. And I said, would you mind if I dug out some old cassette tapes from a, a series of um, meetings that a, a pastor, Morris Venden, uh, had at my college when I was in college, and we could go through those tapes on sin and salvation and having a relationship with Jesus. Let's just do that together and let's kind of work on this together. And he said, absolutely. So we started. We listened to the first two sermons and he said, Don, this is just too good. We got to share this with the other faculty members. So we got another six faculty members joining us and we started at tape number one and we started sharing them with the faculty members. And we got to about five or six and the, the staff said, wait a minute, this is too good. We got to share this with the students. So we put our heads together and this is what we decided that I would take paper and pencil and I would copy word for word every word off of these cassette tapes. Play a few words, write it. Play a few words, write it. It took me a long time. Twelve sermons. And then I would read them or preach them word for word and one of the faculty would translate them from English into Swahili so the students could get it both in English and Swahili. They were learning English, you see, and they could get the most out of these sermons. Well, just about the time that we were starting this series, my oldest son got extremely sick, deathly sick. And Nellie, who was a trained nurse, she diagnosed it as hepatitis A. Well, that was concerning. I was on the radio trying to get some help. You see, our car had been sort of broken down. It had some of the rear springs that were broken. And to drive that car that slow would take about 10 hours to get to the nearest hospital through wilderness. It was too dangerous to take the entire family, take that risk. So I was on the radio trying to get a hold of somebody and I couldn't. I guess they were at some meetings or something. And Carrie got well, but then Nellie got sick and she was really sick. And out of the blue came my friend, another missionary, who brought a, a woman to stay with me and the children to look after us, because it's, it's hard to teach full time and take care of children and cook, like I said. And then they took Nellie to the largest hospital in Tanzania. 
and about that time, I was doing about two or three of these sermons a week, and I was up to sermon number nine, and the topic was called trust. And the essence of this sermon was how we need to trust God. And trust means, God, I want to love you and trust you anyway, even if you don't answer the prayers that I'm praying, even when things go wrong. I finished that topic of trust, and as I was exiting into the dark night through the back door, I remember seeing my friend standing there, the one who took Nellie to the hospital. He hugged me, and he whispered in my ear, Dawn, Nellie didn't make it. She's gone. He had to practically carry me up the hill to my house. It's a blur. What I remember is taking my four children into my bedroom and just sitting them down and saying, kids, mommy died. We're not going to see her again until we all get to heaven. And then we crawled into my bed, everyone hugging and clinging onto each other. No one could say anything. I don't remember how I got through that night. It was one of the toughest things in life that I've ever experienced. How did you get through that with your family, your support system being in Canada, and there you were in Africa? It was not easy. They had the funeral and the burial on the school campus. And I remember standing there uh, as the coffin was beside the hole they were gonna put it into, and I was praying. I said, God, Raise her from the dead. You can do it. You can just wake her up and we'll get her out of this box. And I mean, just like you did Lazarus, God, why can't you do it? You can do it. And then I had this thought. This thought was, why would God do that for me when right now, at this moment, there's probably a thousand other people in the world praying the exact same prayer. We buried her. And after the funeral, I was hanging around there and a missionary that I had never met before, he came up to me and he put his arm around my shoulder and he said, Don, we may not know why God caused Nelly to die, but we do know that he's trying to teach you a lesson. I froze. I didn't know what to say. I felt like I'd just been stabbed in the heart with a knife. Just a few hours later, I came down very sick. I started off with malaria, and then I got what I was sure was hepatitis A on top of it. I don't remember anything after that. I guess I went unconscious. Because I woke up in a neighboring country, in a hospital, in a room, isolated and alone, knowing nobody in that city. And I spent 30 days in a small room in Nairobi, in a hospital, intravenously fed, putting together jigsaw puzzles. But the whole time I was thinking about that missionary's words and beating myself up, I must have been a bad missionary, otherwise God wouldn't have killed my wife, Nellie. After 30 days and 90 pounds is all I weighed, I went back to greet my children and my friends back in Tanzania. And I began to still question God. Why, God, would you even allow such a... These are four kids. And then one day, in my personal devotional life, which I had resurrected by those meetings, I came across the story of John the Baptist and how King Herod had him beheaded. And Jesus said that John the Baptist was the greatest of the prophets. And that's when I started to think, okay, something's off here. Maybe I'm not the worst missionary in the world. And that very day, I got a telegram from another missionary who had gone back to America a few months before Nellie passed. He was kind of a father mentor to me and my family, a wonderful man, Dr. Hart. And I got a, a, a telegram from Dr. Hart. 
And it simply said, Don, Nellie's death was not the will of God. An enemy did this. That was medicine. That was medicine. And that sent me on a journey. A journey of searching the scriptures, asking questions, studying, trying to find an explanation of why bad things happen to people. The first thing that I concluded was that God never causes evil to take place. He's a God of love. And yet in the Bible, we see that God, they talk like God caused something to happen when really he didn't. Like take King Saul. The Bible's clear. King Saul commits suicide with his own sword. But a few verses later, it says God killed Saul for his disobedience. So sometimes I find in the Bible, it, it talks like God caused what he didn't prevent. But then I struggled with this whole idea of, well, then why doesn't he prevent things? Why does he allow bad things to happen? And then I, my second conclusion was, well, if he's a God of love, he has to be a God of freedom because you can't force people to love you. God can't, God, God knows you can't say, love me or I'll break your arm. You, we would never do that. A Nazi guard can force a prisoner to do whatever they want them to do, but there's one thing a Nazi guard in a prison camp could never do, force a prisoner to love him. And God knows that. So I concluded that God has to be love, and if he's love, he has to be love all the time, or he's not love. And I found it frustrating that I would listen to Christians say things like, oh, God healed my aunt of cancer. God is so good. Or I got my dream job. God is so good. But then other times they would say, my brother just died of cancer. And there'd be this strange silence as if to say, God is not good. So either he's good all the time or he's not good at all. So how do we reconcile that apparent contradiction? If God is a God of love, he has to be a God of freedom. Freedom is required for love. And when he gives us freedom, that means people will use their freedom to do bad, evil things. There will be suffering. There will be death in this world. You know, it's not God's will that anybody die or, or suffer. It's only God's will in that it's his will that we have freedom so we can have love in this world. Your life must have been really lonely without your wife, Nelly. Absolutely. It was one of the toughest periods of time in my life. But we moved back to Canada and I began teaching school and I needed a nanny, a babysitter to look after my children. And this elderly lady in the community, uh, she did that for me. And in her home where we used to eat our, our dinners every night, there was a, a younger later lady about my age. And I just thought that her husband was a logger and came home on weekends but i discovered later she was single never been married before and long story short my kids fell in love with her and we fell in love with each other we dated and uh, one time on our our way home uh, one of my youngest my youngest daughter says penny are you going to marry my daddy he's lonely we all kind of froze and we're silent <laughs> and it was a few years after we got married that uh, Penny's celiac disease, which is a really terrible disease. She'd get diarrhea, she'd spend a lot of time in the hospital. It got really bad. And then it became so bad that her intestines completely closed off. They even did surgeries, removing parts of her intestines five feet at a time. And, and she couldn't eat any longer. Nothing could go through. They had to put a hole in her stomach to drain the stomach juices. Uh, she had to be hooked up with an intravenous feeding. She did that like 12 hours every 24 hours. And so she was fed directly into her, her veins by this. Basically, our home became a hospital. And for 12 years, we lived like this, our home, a hospital. I was trained as a nurse to help her. She was trained to help herself. 12 agonizing years, knowing that she not only could die, but she would die anytime. And so after 23 years of marriage, she finally gave in. Uh, the doctor said that she held, he thought the world's record for staying alive on TPN, as, as they called it. So now you lost your second wife, and that must have been traumatic, 12 years. How did you go through all of that? 
If it wasn't for this belief about God being a God who runs his universe on the principle of freedom and love, I, I would have been angry at God. I would have blamed God for, for doing it a second time, so to speak. But that got me through. And you know, Penny had a close relationship with God as well. And she had this wonderful sense of humor. And we tried to just live our life, even though we had all this medical equipment, we would travel and we would live our life as normal as possible. After she passed away, I, I married one of her best friends, Juanita, who's my wife today. So Don, in closing, is there anything else that you would like to add that you have learned from the pain of losing two wives? Absolutely. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Romans 8, verse 28. In all things, God works together for good to those who love God. In this verse, I understand that in all things includes all things, the good and the bad, but God never causes bad things to happen. There's the law of freedom. But when they do, if you keep trusting God, you still stay with God, stay in relationship with God and walk with God, in the end, he can make things better. All things can become good again. And if they're not good yet, it's still not the end. Before we end, I wonder if you could please pray for us. Sure. Father God, life can be tough at times. Because there's freedom, pain happens in this world. But Lord, I, I thank you for that freedom because without it, we couldn't have the wonderful thing we, we know to be love. And we thank you for love and connection and family. Lord, right now there are probably people watching that are hurting. And, and they're suffering. And we know that you're with them and you think about them, you comfort them, help them to reach out to you as the God of freedom and love. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, amen. Don, thank you so much for sharing your personal story with us on It Is Written Canada today. You're welcome. Friends, as Don Straub shared with us, God is not only God of love, but God of freedom. And we want to give you a chance to learn more about this freedom by sending you our free offer today, which is Don Straub's book entitled Bridges to Freedom, Creating Change Through Science and Christian Spirituality. Move closer to the Lord, Get past your mistakes and learn life lessons with the essential bridges to freedom described in this book. Before you go, we would also like to invite you to follow us on Instagram and Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel and also listen to our podcasts. And if you go to our website, you can see our latest programs, including our cooking demonstrations, our short spiritual messages entitled Daily Living, and our exercise workouts called Experiencing Life. We want you to experience the truth that is found in the words of Jesus when he said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. One day we were talking and, and Juanita said, did you know that Penny gave me and my sister a list of women? And, we, and she told us we were supposed to make sure you didn't marry any of these women on the list. That kind of shows her humor. But of course I had to ask Juanita, was your name on the list? And we had a good laugh about that.